Pharmacy Friends brings industry experts to the same table to talk about what's happening in pharmacy today, what's coming, and most importantly, what it means to you. We explore and share pharmacy trends stemming from the evolving healthcare market, where advancements, policy changes, and technical advancements make a difference. In today's episode, we take you to the Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy AMCP annual meeting, which is happening in New Orleans. Leading researchers from Prime Therapeutics and Magellan RX are at the show, and we talk with these healthcare experts from our clinical and health outcomes teams who are using integrated medical and pharmacy claims data to evaluate real world drug utilization, managed care pharmacy programs, and associated costs of care for a range of conditions, including weight loss, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and multiple sclerosis. And in the spirit of our host city, we have a little fun with our guests and see how much they know about the Big Easy. We even have a drop-in visit from Susan Cantrell, AMCP CEO, who talks with us about how AMCP is on the forefront of pharmacy trends, but also how the organization seeks to improve access to care and reduce costs, particularly as healthcare trends show that the pharmacy benefit is becoming more expensive. AMCP Annual is a top-tier industry event, and for Prime MRX, it's a key moment for us to showcase our research and insights that help shape how we serve both clients and members. To tell you more about our presence at the show, we're joined by Pat Gleason, Assistant Vice President of Health Outcomes, and David Eckright, Senior Director of Clinical Project and Program Management. All right, well, Pat and David, thank you for joining us. I know it's been a busy week, but how's it been so far? Great, it's been awesome. AMCP Annual is a key event on the Prime MRX calendar, but let's take a step back and perhaps for those of us who are not in the healthcare space, what makes AMCP Annual so important to our business and how does it connect with our business priorities? Well, that's a great question. Um, Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy is an organization of uh, healthcare professionals uh, focused on trying to ensure a cost-effective uh, medication use and ensuring affordability of the, the pharmacy benefit. And this organization then with its 7,000 plus members, Alex, uh, has about 3,500 people here um, that are all focused on the same thing. You know, you've got the pharmaceutical manufacturers, you've got the, what you call the payers, the health plans, the PBMs. You have vendors that are offering services um, and selling products to try to you know, ensure the most cost-effective and affordable medications can be used. Um, you know, with, a focus in, with a Prime Magellan's focus on providing the same care we want for our loved ones. But by having all those people in one place, um, you've got the thought leadership, you've got these ses- educational sessions. So there's a lot of great learnings, but then also there's that intangible interaction that you have, and, and, and also the research being shared. And we at Prime and Magellan have you know, some really great cutting edge research. So we can demonstrate our thought leadership with our integrated medical pharmacy analytics, um, as well as uh, learn from others. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, Pat hit on almost everything there, so it's not a lot more to <laughs> add on to what he said, but I do just want to emphasize, uh, you know, the unique environment it creates with all these different uh, experts from across these different industry sectors, as Pat mentioned, health plans, pharmacy benefit managers, life science, technology companies, and it's really nice because it provides a lot of uh, uh, benefits like gauging market direction so across all the m- complex dimensions of our industry so for example there's seminars here um, on anticipating regulatory shifts clinical advancements technology innovations um, also as Pat mentioned offers a forum to strengthen our relationships with by personal interactions with our clients and key partners in our industry and again as Pat said I can't add much more but just showcasing that thought leadership or it's really a, a good medium to have our posters and and presentations that we have yeah, I'll just add, you know, as nicely said, uh, David, around our clients too, our, and, our, and our Blue Plan owners and the clients we serve are here, as well as the potential for new business. Mm-hmm. You know, by demonstrating and being active in the organization, being active in the, the research presentations, you know, we're showing that we are the leaders in the management of, of drugs, and in particular medical benefit drugs. It's, it's just a great opportunity mm-hmm. to do that. That's awesome. Yes, so at AMCP Annual 2023, it was the first time that Prime and MRX appeared together at an industry trade conference. So now our researchers are working as one team. How have they complemented each other and how we show up at these events? Yeah, it's a, you know, uh, Legacy Magellan, Legacy Prime, it, it, 
such a synergy between the two organizations with uh, Magellan's legacy products and services for the medical benefit uh, drugs, uh, ensuring like if back to the, the most cost effective affordable therapies um, through the medical benefit with the products that Legacy Magellan has and then with Prime Therapeutics and on the, more of a focus on the pharmacy benefit pure side and in uh, the analytics that we have done so you know in the areas of like GLP-1s, those Wegovies and Ozempics and Manjaro Zepbound you know we just came, Dave and I just came from a session where we, we were the thought leaders that we presented for 30 minutes and it was a packed room on, on our GLP-1 cost effectiveness analysis and, and adherence persistency and that was exciting to see. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, the collective expertise of our researchers and clinical uh, experts that are here is like, it's astonishing. It's mm -hmm. awesome to be a part of. I'm grateful. I get to learn from Pat, who's just like a juggernaut in this area. <laughs> and uh, it's, it is a perfect example of our synergy in action. And you can just look at the topics that we're presenting this week. I mean, it spans benefits, pharmacy, medical benefit. It spans areas of pharmacy, so specialty. We have things on oncology, biosims, cell and gene therapy, traditional drugs, as Pat mentioned, huge deep dives in GLP-1s social determinants of health, and also uh, clinical programs that we've done too, like bile rounding and some high-touch interventions on generic utilization. And I think just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a broad, uh, you know, list of research, but each one provides a really deep dive into these um, areas that really supports our decision-making and development and assessment of some of our programs and solutions. And I'll, I'll rattle on a little bit more because this is like one of the coolest things that I've got to experience in my six years here is watching how research kind of builds on itself over time. And one example I got to be a part of with Pat is, you know, we started to look at drug spend from a different angle, not, you know, on a drug level or category. We started looking at the person level, the, the cumulative cost across a pharmacy and medical benefit and saw this, this cost concentrating on such a small group of individuals. It was like zero point zero three two percent yeah. <laughs> was ten percent of total drug spend and we're just you know think, asking ourselves what can we do to better help these members ensure they're using these drugs in the most cost effective way and really warranted a high touch approach and that's how a uh, high touch product uh, spun out from that and had really impressive results so far um, and, and a lot of those interventions are being showcased at AMCP and one one at this conference as well and I'll just add at the end for listeners uh, you know interested in learning more about these, a great resource is the Prime website press release section. Uh, a lot of times there's links out to the posters in there and it's, it's just a great place to, to dive in and learn more about these. That's great. So obviously the health outcomes and clinical teams have taken a, lot, a, a look at a lot of topics. And I'm not going to rattle off the entire list because that would just be silly. But taking a step back, what does the process look like when the team selects a research topic and how does it lead to an AMCP poster, briefly speaking? Sure, I'll start with this one. Um, so really we select the topics based on notable knowledge gaps that occur in the industry, and those can happen from various events. It could be a new drug that gets put in the market, new formulations, new indication, guideline updates, you know, second line cancer therapy now goes to first line. What does that mean for us, you know, or in, in terms of drug spend? Um, or maybe now enough time has passed that we have data to look at to assess um, drug utilization in the real world to address these knowledge gaps. Um, and the goal is really to dive into these topics to pave the way for you know, innovative solutions that we can have and inform our decision making. Um, and many times our findings of our research is something that we feel is so important that we want to share more broadly to help elevate industry knowledge and shape the dialogue around a particular product. And you know, Paz dove into GLP-1s and I think we've been, had been a major voice and knowledge gap filler <laughs> in that space. Um, and, and a major way we uh, you know, communicate this is, is through AMCP, through poster presentations and seminar presentations. Yeah, it's a great question, Alex. Uh, when it really comes down to it, it's trying to answer those business questions that we all have on how to best ensure cost-effective, safe medication use. And seeing them as the market events emerge and then quickly building out the analytic method to assess the, what I just said, like the cost effectiveness of therapy um, and having the team ready. And with the combined now teams of Magellan and Prime, we're ready. And, we, and here we are today, you know, and in this co conference sharing our findings uh, around 
as David nicely pointed out, you know, our, our service offerings to answer those business questions as well as to deliver on a product like HighTouch RX and Integrated RX for oncology drug management and the, and the Magellan MRX medical pharmacy product to ensure med the medications processed through the medical benefit are the most cost of appropriate, cost effective appropriate safe products to be used. Um, it's fun to be part of the, the thought leadership and also learn from others what they're doing so we can take that back and make our, make our work and, and, and services better. That's great. So in the last year, prime MRX studies presented AMCP and AMCP Nexus have earned by my count six awards. So tell us what these accolades mean for the team. Well, they're, they're reaffirming. They're, they're, you know, it makes us proud uh, that we, we know that from, because this comes from the Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy and through a peer review process that we have no influence over these awards. So it's not like these are getting paid for in any way. You know, these are awards that are earned for the quality of the work done. And it, you know, it's, it, it feels great to have been a part of uh, the ability to you know, have a team supported by the leadership of Prime Magellan and then to be recognized, it's, it's, it's marvelous. Yeah, I would just add, you know, from my previous answer about, you know, knowledge gaps, like we identify these across the company. It's not just one group. We have experts everywhere across the company, government programs, clinical, account management, hearing these things. So, you know, how we are prioritizing and diving into these and now getting, a, you know, these awards really gives us confirmation that we have a finger on the pulse of the industry. We're focusing our efforts in the right place, which enables us to provide these industry leading insights. All right. So before I let you go, we have an additional question and it is about our host city of New Orleans. But this is going to be a tougher one. But since we've got two brains on the problem, this, this is going to this is hopefully going to be work out. So here's the question. Approximately how many tons of crawfish are harvested in Louisiana each year? Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. You get to go first. Oh, really, Pat? Yeah. I was hoping you'd triangulate it for me with the first answer. Uh, 50,000. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go a, a magnitude more, 500,000. <laughs> okay. 100 to 120 to 150 million tons. Million. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> that is crazy. Now, okay, here's the next question, and this is a bonus question, but this might be a little easier to triangulate on. Okay. So, according to locals, how many pounds of crawfish should you prepare for each guest in a trip of typical crawfish boil? Mm. I'm going to go one pound. One pound, okay. I'm going four. Between five and eight pounds. Oh my God, how does it eat that much? <laughs> I mean, so and what I've read is that for every five pounds of cooked crawfish, uh, that yields one pound. Okay. Uh, so, we, there you go. I got a dissolution problem that a pharmacist probably shouldn't be able to solve. <laughs> <laughs> I failed. <laughs> uh, don't be too hard on yourself. But thank you for joining us, Pat and David. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. me. It's great to be thank here. You. Thank you. So I've had the pleasure of attending the 2023 AMCP Annual Meeting, AMCP Nexus, and now AMCP Annual 2024. And the energy from attendees and the topics covered at the conference seems to keep getting bigger with each passing event. We're fortunate to have Susan Cantrell, AMCP CEO, join us for a conversation on what this conference means and how it continues to have an impact on the healthcare industry. We also have Pat Gleason, AVP of Health Outcomes, offer his insights on the conference as well. So how many interviews have you had today so far? This is the first. This is the first one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Good easy, to... Easy day. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll keep it that way. So, Susan, we really appreciate your time, and thank you for coming by. I know it's a very busy schedule, but how has the AMCP... Sh uh, I almost said it. almost said it. I'm going to stop. I'm going to repeat that. I was, I was told to not say show. <laughs> And now I'm thinking about it all the Thank time. you for that. <laughs> Did you tell him that? Thank you, Pat. See? Yes. Pat it's a conference, not exactly. a show. Exactly. <laughs> it's a conference. Exactly. So, Susan, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And thank you for all of your time prepping for this. But I just want to say that it's a pleasure to have you. And I know you have a lot of commitments during the conference. So thank you for your time. Um, so tell us a little bit about the conference. How's it going for you? Well, first off, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's going quite well, I would say. 
We are back to pre-pandemic levels for our attendance. So we've got 3,500 of our closest managed care pharmacy professional friends here in the city of New Orleans. I think uh, there's a really positive vibe, lots of energy, in spite of all the challenges that we're collectively facing. Uh, everyone seems happy to be together and to be in this great city. So, so far so good. That's terrific. So tell us a little bit about how AMCP has worked to be at the forefront of pharmacy trends to improve access and reduce costs. So particularly as healthcare trends show that the pharmacy benefit is becoming more expensive. That's what we're all about at AMCP, obviously, um, improving health by ensuring patients have access to high quality but affordable medicines is really critical. And we all know that the cost of healthcare in the U.S. is rising astronomically. Um, just recently, a study came out from Reuters that shows the median price of new novel therapeutics approved by the FDA in 2021 was 180000 That jumped to 222000 in 2022, and in 2023, it was 300000 Astronomical leaps in, in the cost of therapies. However, we're in this remarkable period of innovation, so our challenge becomes um, how do we pay for all of this? And um, part of what we do at AMCP as we look at the pharmacy trend and the challenges associated with affordability of prescription drugs is advocate for policy changes that might be helpful. And one that's top of mind for us right now is called the Medicaid Value-Based Pricing Act, or MVP Act, um, introduced in this session of Congress by Congressman Guthrie. What that would do is kind of clear the way for value-based purchasing in the Medicaid program, helping some of our most vulnerable patients. And so that's one area that we're looking at. And I guess another example in terms of if we think about the cost of, of healthcare and prescription drugs, what's really important is that we use those therapies correctly. And how better to do that than with the aid of our well-trained, very skilled pharmacists. So there's a bill in Congress right now called the Equitable Community Access to Pharmacy Services, or ECAPS bill, and we're working with our partners across the pharmacy spectrum to encourage Congress to pass that bill, which would open up the door for pharmacists uh, to test, treat, um, and vaccinate against various communicable diseases on a large scale, and also get compensated for those services. So a lot happening in that area, but that's right in uh, our areas of focus. That's excellent. So let's talk a little bit about diversity and health equity. So they're also key AMCP values. So how does the organization work with pharmacists, physicians, nurses, and biopharmaceutical company professionals to ensure managed care pharmacy improves these health disparities? We're pleased that so many organizations and disciplines like AMCP have really latched on to the importance of enhancing health equity and addressing gaps and disparities that exist in terms of healthcare access as well as uh, use of medicines. And it's been a strategic priority for us since 2021 where our board saw in the wake of the pandemic um, the, the disparities that were really laid bare in that public health emergency and said, we have a role to play in this as AMCP. We need to do something about it. And they really stepped up to the plate um, to make addressing disparities in medication use and access a strategic priority for the organization. And we continue our work in this area. We've recognized that AMCP as an organization uh, can't itself um, ameliorate all the problems that exist out there, but what we can do is take a leading role by elevating the issue in our members' minds and sharing information and best practices about what can be done. So for example, um, at each of our meetings going back to 2021, we've had sessions that focus on um, health plan efforts and PBM efforts to really address uh, healthcare disparities and improve access. Um, we continue to do that. We have a resource site on our web center. And I mentioned a moment ago the MVP Act, you know, that's a perfect example of where we're looking at the Medicaid population and how do we ensure that those patients have access to these cutting edge therapies that are coming to market with very high price tags. 
um, this is part of that effort. And I would say um, one other thing that we think is really important is to shine a light on the great work that our members are doing in this area and addressing uh, health equity challenges. And so we have a campaign going on right now to really elevate the visibility of managed care pharmacy. We're calling it We Are MCPs. And we hope that through that, we'll continue to shine a light on the good work that's being done and encourage others to share programs and, and really take up the stake to address health equity head on. And if I could, I want to also mention our journal as a source of great information on this topic. In 2022, we issued a call for papers on healthcare disparities. Since then, we've published about 30. Um, I'm happy to say I have one that just yesterday got accepted for publication, so we'll see it soon. But um, we're really focusing on that in all channels of AMCP communication. That's wonderful. And obviously, yeah, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, um, Susan, you know, I'm really proud of what AMCP does, and, you know, as Prime Magellan RX, uh, you know, our work to uh, ensure that we're delivering care to the, as we would to our loved ones. Um, it, we, it, you know, and given the opportunity, and thank AMCP for that, you know, we have a session here on, on a presentation on uh, using uh, social determinants of health information to better identify medication non-adherence. Um, and share that and learn and learn from others as well. I mean, it was a great session yesterday on social determinants of health and the impact that the, having that information can have, try to improve adherence from uh, um, MTM outcomes as an organization. So I just want to say that thank you for that. And, you know, um, we continue to work together to, you know, learn and uh, help those that have those health disparities and address them. Pat, your work at Prime Magellan is exactly the kind of thing that we want to showcase here at AMCP. So I'm glad you brought that up. And the lack of information and data was identified early on by our Health Disparities Advisory Group as one of the biggest challenges to overcoming mm -hmm. these issues. We don't have the data. And so um, managed care pharmacy professionals, I think, play an important role in collecting and documenting that using Z codes or mm -hmm. other methods. Mm -hmm. And so I was delighted to see that on the gen agenda. And thank you for bringing that forward. So how do attendees gain perspectives on these current trends, emerging challenges, and other strategic insights that they need to navigate this ever-evolving landscape? Well, I'll use the example of where we are today uh, as a great one for how they gain insights. Um, coming together in a forum like the AMCP annual meeting or AMCP Nexus this fall is really the best way that I can think of to share and uh, obtain new knowledge and information. We have so many panel discussions here. Uh, we had a session this morning on innovative contracting methodologies with a speaker from the UK who has a global perspective on it. So there's some really, really outstanding uh, sessions taking place here. We, at this meeting, also just released the 5.0 version of our AMCP format for formulary submissions, which has become, over the last 24 years, the gold standard for how payers want to receive information from manufacturers. So there's so much happening here, and I think coming together in a forum like this um, is the best way that, that we can all share knowledge and information. And it doesn't have to just be from the speakers either. I see so many hallway conversations and, you know, the water cooler conversations or like it or not, we're in New Orleans, the conversations over the Sazerac and the bar, you know, <laughs> uh, there, there is so much energy and networking and information sharing that takes place in a forum like this. Susan, can you comment on the Research Institute? I'm super excited to see that. Yes, we are too, Pat. Thank you for that. So AMCP has been in the research space since 2015 when we made the decision to launch what's called the Bio Biologics and Biosimilars Collective Intelligence Consortium, or BBCIC. And that group has done some amazing things over, over the last uh, eight years in terms of um, generating evidence using pharmaceutical claims data as well as other sources, but real world evidence to support decision making with biologics and biosimilars. And what our board decided is we really need to build on that. We have an infrastructure existing now for conducting research that 
also aligns to our AMCP, AMCP Foundation research agenda. So how do we better leverage that for the good of the managed care pharmacy community, but also more importantly for the good of patients? So we announced yesterday the launch of the AMCP Research Institute that will do just that, build on the work that we've done on BBCIC. BBCIC will remain as it is and continue to do its good work, but we'll use what we've learned and developed from that um, to really broaden our research footprint in, in managed care pharmacy, and very excited about that. And the collaboration between the payer organizations and the pharmaceutical manufacturers. That's what AMCP brings those groups together to then move forward on real world evidence generation to help people get the medications they need and live well at an affordable price. That's the holy grail and we're working toward that together through AMCP. Exactly. You're going to be hearing a lot from us, too, on the topic of real-world evidence in 2024. It's one of our priorities in our thought leadership uh, portfolio. So we have a lot of work that we're doing in that area. It's evolved so much over the years. So uh, what does really good real-world evidence that payers can use look like? And how do we make sure that we are conducting studies uh, that are aligned with the best practices? And how do we disseminate that information? And then on the payer side, how do we use that information um, in the best way? So you'll hear a lot from us on and, RWE. And that <laughs> affordability problem you started out with at $300,000 a year. You know, how are we ensuring that that's good investment? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So talking about real world data, that was obviously a key feature of our GLP-1 research, which we're talking about at the show. But I was just going to say, or at the conference rather, but what are some of the other trends that you're tracking at the conference this year? It's hard to keep up, certainly, with uh, everything happening in our world because it is such a rapidly changing space. I would say one thing that will continue, I think, to gain steam uh, that has been on our radar screen for a number of years and certainly uh, top of, of mind for all of our members is uh, evolving treatments for rare diseases. Those come typically with very high price tags and so affordability is a significant challenge. That's not likely to go away. We know there are 7,000 plus uh, rare diseases that have been identified and uh, our speaker this morning shared that when you look globally, one in 17 people suffers from a rare disease. And if you think about the impact of that on a patient population when a new therapy comes out that's in the seven figures, it's significant. So how do we afford this innovation? That's not going away anytime soon. But you mentioned GLP-1s, and I think that is an issue that hasn't completely caught us by surprise, but it's kind of added a curveball that maybe we hadn't thought so much about because you've got a, a therapy that, yes, it is expensive, but by today's standards, uh, not, uh, uh, not a high investment therapy per se, but you've got a very large potential patient population. Mm -hmm. The same could be said for a disease like non um, uh, alcoholic steato hepatitis, so NASH and MASH, uh, those are evolving diseases with very large populations, and so um, affordability takes on a different uh, lens when you look at that. So I think those will continue to be um, major issues for us. And then I would say we're in a um, challenging political year. We're in an election year, and um, Healthcare policies are, are top of mind for the politicians and also for the voters. And so that creates this element of uncertainty. And none of us probably enjoys uncertainty. And in healthcare, we need um, you know stability and certainty. And so an election year causes us to take a step back and say, what will this mean long term, um, depending on how the election goes to health policy and, and uh, health legislation in the coming year. So there's a lot to think about in the world of managed care pharmacy right now. There certainly is. So we're going to have a little departure with our next question. We've been asking all of our guests some questions about our host city, and we're going to have an opportunity for you to join the fund. So a question about New Orleans. Dr. John had a spanning career in music and is widely recognized for his talent as a piano player, but that was not his first instrument. After suffering a gunshot wound in the 1960s that injured his ring finger, he found it difficult to play this instrument and made a change. What was that instrument? Oh 
my goodness. Guitar? It is, correct. <laughs> <laughs> well done. And I'm wondering if that was the reason, that experience was the reason that he wrote the song. I was in the right place, but it must have been the wrong time. <laughs> you know what? You might be right about that. This has been a terrific conversation, Susan, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Four of the prime MRX studies presented at AMCP relate to GLP-1 drugs. An earlier analysis from Prime MRX of real-world data showed low adherence and increased cost of care for individuals using these drugs for weight loss in the first year of therapy. Prime MRX has been a leader in GLP-1 insights, and two of the studies at AMCP take a fresh look at our data related to these drugs and weight loss. Today we have Ben Urich, Health Outcomes Research Senior Principal from Prime MRX, here to walk us through this research. Well, Ben, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for stopping by. Lots of buzz about GLP-1s at the conference, aren't there? Tons, yeah. Lots of people asking GLP-1-related questions, lots of good content on GLP-1s as well. Good, good. So I know the run-up to AMCP is usually very busy, but this year was perhaps even more so because the Prime MRX GLP-1 studies were added as a spotlight session this mm -hmm. week. So how has the presentation prep been going in the, in the face of all the other things you've been trying to manage for the conference? You know, it's been uh, it's been good. It was a nice late addition to the program. Uh, we've got uh, theater all set up for this. I'm a little bit nervous. I've had a lot of people uh, say that they want to be there, and it has uh, seating for 50. So it'll be interesting to see how many people we can squeeze in, into uh, into uh, theater one. But um, I'm looking forward to it. That's awesome. So we've covered our original study on GLP ones quite extensively. But the study found low adherence and increased cost of care for people who newly initiated GLP-1 treatment after one year. So what are some of the additional findings that we're sharing at AMCP? Yeah, it's a great question. So the findings that we are presenting at AMCP are really a more detailed version of what has been presented in uh, press releases and kind of a, a more detailed abstract. We do have a paper that has been accepted by the Journal of Managed Care Pharmacy on our adherence and persistence work. So that's actually kind of going to come out probably before the middle of this year, which will be nice. Um, the, the work that I'm presenting is, is a uh, presentation on those posters. One thing I will probably mention, although it is not in the slides because it was finished relatively recently, is we have ongoing work looking at a two-year extension of this. So we have members who initiated therapy in 2021. We are currently following them for a year after initiation, so up until the end of 2022, depending on when they indexed in 2021. We are now looking at those same members through 2023. And so uh, we, won't, we won't have any sort of slides with that information on it, but we, we, are, we can share that when we look at persistence with those members, we do see persistence continue to fall, which is to say we do see members continuing to discontinue continue therapy. Uh, however, the rate of discontinuation does uh, slow down, and so persistence tends to level off in the second year. Those who uh, remain persistent through the first year are much more likely to be persistent in, in the second year, um, and which is about what you would expect with this, but it is something that's, that's nice to sort of confirm through a two-year extension. And I, again, I will probably mention that uh, during the presentation. That's great. So since we announced our study in 2023, We've had terrific coverage, and clients and consumers have certainly taken notice. But what's been the reaction from the industry? So the industry has certainly taken notice as well. Uh, and mostly it's been positive, which I didn't necessarily expect. I, I guess I should say mostly it's been positive as people have been, been talking to me about it. So who knows what's actually happening behind closed doors. But um, we, we uh, uh, so I, I had an opportunity to, pre to present this work at the um, Tennessee Alabama affiliate a couple weeks ago, and most of that room was, was pharma. And so you do have some people who are tied to the manufacturing process of these, and they, they may be a little bit less um, willing to, to sort of, you know, speak. But, but for, for those who are in pharma and a little bit more distant from that, there's a lot, there's still a lot of interest in this. And so people are asking about, for, th for example, things like, when we now see some cardiovascular indication for this, what is the mechanism behind it? When do we start to see these effects take place? Given that we start to see the effects immediately, what is the mechanism behind that? When it comes to adherence and persistence, then it's around, well, this sort of makes sense. You're not going to see adherence and persistence like you would in a clinical trial, but what can be done to actually try to maintain adherence or improve persistence in this as well? And we recognize that there are a lot of challenges with adherence and persistence, um, especially when it comes to things like shortages, and so that also comes up as, as a part of this. But, you know, it certainly has, it just, it's just been, been a lot of... Um, conversation generating uh, uh, talk uh, and and not as uh, you know not as skeptical as, as I thought it could be which is which has been which has been great that's good so one of our recommendations is that individuals taking GLP-1 drugs for weight loss do so as part of a comprehensive weight loss 
treatment program, which may improve persistency. So how do you see this recommendation being received by healthcare providers, pharmacists, consumers? You know, I think uh, taking steps to, to improve or, or maintain persistency is, is a good thing. The persistence rates that we see in our study, looking at, you know, an average across all of our products, about 32% for those who initiated in uh, 2021 who did not have diabetes but did have obesity. So we're sort of assuming that they're using this for, for obesity. That's, that's it's really low. Um, we do see the highest persistence rates among uh, the semaglutide users, so Ozempic and Wegovy had uh, adherence in the, in the mid to upper, uh, persistence in the mid to upper 40s, which is obviously much better. Um, but, but still, that's, that's less than 50%, right? So the majority of people who initiated in 2021 um, discontinued therapy. So what can, we, what can we do to try to maintain that? I think using these drugs as part of a, a program would be a very good thing um, that allows a member to be focused on sort of the intent of this therapy, right? To certainly try to get the value that we would think that is there um, to try to get that out of, out of these products by, by using as a part of a program that can maintain weight loss. If you discontinue early, we expect the weight loss to come back. And so I think a, there's, there's a strong role for a program like this. I mean, you know, a little bit hesitant on, on the role of, of access and that sort of things, creating additional barriers to, to use these products for members who may not absolutely need to be enrolled in a program. But I think, you know, to the extent that a program is available to members, using it is a good thing. So as you've presented this data in other forums, what are some of the questions that you've heard from audiences that surprise you most? You know, so um, the questions that we get from the audience that are pretty common are around things like, what are drivers of this non-persistence? And it's going to be a combination of product availability, um, patient preferences and side effects, for example, patient preferences over, you know, injection or not, side effects that they get, and then obviously, again, availability of these products, um, which I think we've, we've done a decent job at least uh, highlighting that. You can't do a whole lot about that within our data. The, the data are what the data are. But um, we, can, we can sort of, you know, address that as a part of the limitations when we discuss that. We also get a lot of questions around, so we see about a $1,500 uh, increase in medical spending in the year following initiation of a GLP-1. We get a lot of follow-up questions around what is driving that. Like, let's let's open that hood a little bit and try to see inside of of, of, the, of that engine that's driving this increase in medical spending. And that is something we, we could have insight in. It's part of our ongoing work to try to get, get in the details on this. What we think is, and what we've sort of seen some signals of, is especially for members who are initiating a GLP-1 and using it off-label, you would absolutely expect that a provider in that situation would want a member to come back talk with that provider and, and have some sort of series of visits where, where they're monitoring therapy, right? So that additional monitoring and the visits associated with that is going to increase spending. We also see some signals around members who are, for example, trying to lose weight in order to become eligible for certain surgeries. So like, um, you know, bariatric surgery, hip and knee replacement, that sort of thing. You ha you, you, if you are so large um, that you can't qualify for that surgery, using a GLP-1 to drop weight to then become qualified makes a lot of sense. And of course, then when you drop that weight and you have that surgery, that increases the, the mean medical spending for those users. And so we think that it's a combination of increased monitoring and some sort of increased service utilization as a result of that. It's probably what's driving that, but that is something that we want to look at a little bit more closely with additional analyses. The data are what the data are. I like that. That's right. So we're asking our guests some trivia questions associated Oof. with New Orleans. And so now is your turn. So in August, of 1975, the Superdome opened its doors, but in 1981, this band played to nearly 88,000 fans, which held the record for the largest indoor concert for nearly three decades. What was that band? <laughs> oh man, I mean, it's got to be some like stadium rock group, is like like mm -hmm. uh, is is what is what I would think. Um, Uh, something ACDC. Mm, the Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones. The yes. Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones. That makes more sense. Yes. And I, I'm, I'm to understand they're going to be back next week for the Jazz oh, really? Festival. Which, oh, well, that's fun. Yeah. Right? They're, they're, still, they're still doing it. They're still doing they're it. They're still exactly. doing it. Yeah. That's good, good, good for them. <laughs> yeah. The Rolling Stones. There you go. Nice. Ben, it's great to have you, and we really appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate being here. Thank you much. Yes. Cancer care represents a rising and disproportionate share of overall healthcare spend. Medically integrated dispensing has been associated with better outcomes, lower waste, and better patient care. In recognizing this value, payers have developed integrated dispensing networks to supplement traditional dispensing methods. 
However, little information is available to compare total cost of care. Today, we talk with Landon Marshall, Health Outcomes Research Principal at Prime MRX, to take a closer look at this issue. Well, welcome to the podcast, Landon, and it is very good to have you. Take it you're enjoying New Orleans so far? Yes, yes. Um, you know, meeting up with a lot of coworkers that we get to see remotely, um, but actually have in-person discussions has been great. Um, you know, meeting with, uh, you know, other researchers and discussing sort of, you know, hot topics for them and uh, what they're focusing on. Um, looks like a lot of GLP-1 discussion, a lot of cancer oncology, gene therapy. So we're seeing some common themes, you know, over the years, um, you know, since I've been with Prime and I'm excited for what the future has. So on that note, why don't you give us a quick rundown of your research and what was found? Yeah, so the uh, research I'm, you know, discussing, presenting this week is around um, medically integrated dispensing, um, total cost of care associated with different uh, dispensing channels um, in terms of oral oncolytic um, utilization uh, for, for our members in the commercial book of business. So as we've noted, both AMCP and Primaric, hmm, excuse me, so as we've noted, both AMCP and Prime MRX believe in the value of research like this to enhance quality and reduce costs. But tell us a little bit about how these principles show up in the study. So we, you know, we we look at the literature and try to inform, you know, our research, our business questions based on what's published in the literature. And so, you know, we've leveraged that. Um, to inform what we do internally based on our resources, um, and then also to support um, products that we're putting out in the market for clients. And one of those is, you know, our integrated RX product, which is different in that, you know, we're looking at medically integrated dispensing of oral oncolytics, but this is from the perspective of in-office physician dispensing, which is a little bit different than what you see in the literature, which focuses on non-integrated versus integrated from a health system specialty pharmacy perspective. Um, so bringing those principles into our research, um, looking at the financial value from total cost of care, um, integrating medical and pharmacy claims data, looking at the spend on both the medical and pharmacy uh, benefits side. So we've kind of taken all of those things into consideration, what's in the literature, um, what we want to demonstrate as far as value of our products that we're offering for our clients. Um, and so we're excited to kind of, you know, put this initial um, research out into the public domain and, and discuss it with other colleagues. So on that theme of integrated RX, with drug prices continuing to trend upward, what are some of the ways that the integrated RX tool can help reduce costs for individuals? So the integrated RX product, um, we it, it's created to um, offer a uh, a solution for physicians that are able to dispense directly to the patient, and so it it opens that conversation about fully integrating medical and pharmacy um, care management in the oncology space. And th this could apply to other disease states as well. Uh, we know oral oncolytics are expensive. Um, I think the latest statistic for just um, cancer medications overall was $88 billion in spend as of wow. 2022. Um, and so we know these, you know, we, we use these drugs um, across a variety of cancer conditions, across different um, treatment stages for these individuals. Uh, so we, we focused really the integrated RX product on, <clears throat> on dispensing and kind of tight management between drug therapy utilization and um, care management that the physician thinks is most appropriate for that individual. Um, and we know that the patient experience is better. We know the provider experience is better. Um, but we didn't have a sense of a true financial value, and we couldn't answer that in the literature. So really that is why we um, you know, conducted this research, and we're actually seeing kind of savings on the medical benefit side, and we are encouraged by that result. So um, you know, we're gonna to continue to explore this area and, and, and seek out the value of integrated RX really on the pharmacy benefit side and the medical benefit side as well. So in recent years, we've conducted studies on drug waste, adherence, so as we look at the real world data and perhaps some of the trends, what are we seeing in terms of improvements in those measures? 
So the um, adherence and, and waste piece was kind of beyond the scope of, of you know, what we're looking at as far as um, total cost of care um, and this particular uh, body of research. I, I know we will kind of head toward, you know, that's, that's future direction for us. Um, so that is part of the integrated RX product team, uh, part of their key performance indicators that they measure. Um, and that's really a discussion with clients. And so we're looking forward to, to understanding what we're seeing now with the research that, that we're presenting this week. Again, the, the discussion has kind of shifted towards the medical benefit side, right? Mm-hmm. And we're trying to understand, like, if we fully integrate the dispensing, the provider, and the, uh, and the patient, then we're seeing kind of care, maybe care quality improves, mm-hmm. um, more judicious use of, of the physician and the, and the patient experience. Um, so it's kind of to be determined, you know, based on our research right now, um, as far as adherence and waste. Um, but we're excited to, to, to kind of dive into that uh, kind of next phase research for us. That's exciting. So in the spirit of our host city, we're asking our guests some trivia questions. <laughs> And it is now time for you to have your knowledge tested on all things New Orleans. So your question is this. In 1868, the McElhinney Company introduced its brand of Louisiana-style hot sauce, Tabasco sauce. From where does the name Tabasco come from? Oh, I don't know. That's... I don't know. I think yesterday was my first experience with Tabasco aioli. Oh, okay. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> so Tabasco has been on the brain. Um, I don't know, Alex. It's the Tabasco pepper from Mexico. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So there I you didn't have know it. That. Yeah. Well, now now you've learned something. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Landon. Uh, appreciate it, Alex. Thank you. We're about to hear about an award-winning research study. Recently, a number of generic multiple sclerosis medications supported by the American Academy of Neurology have become more widely available. Managed care pharmacists can aid individuals in transitioning to generic therapies, reducing total drug spend and member cost. But just how successful can this transition be? Prime MRX researchers took a closer look, and Nick Friedlander, clinical program pharmacist with Prime MRX, explains how this transition may lead to remarkable savings and an improved health outcome. Well, thank you for joining us, Nick, and congratulations to you and your team on uh, this study receiving a gold award yeah, from AMCP. Thank you. So what does it mean to have a, an, a recognition like that for research? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's just really a testament to the hard work of a lot of people who are involved in this. When we think of something like High Touch RX, there's a lot of people like myself functioning in the background to try to drive these outcomes. Um, and then we have the boots on the ground pharmacists that are really totally invaluable to what we do. Um, so I think it's just a testament to the work of, of this group and, and the quality of research that Prime puts out. I think that's really a hallmark of Prime. And one of the things I value the most is the commitment to the research that we put out and putting out quality research. So past research from Prime MRX has looked at a range of factors to improve costs for patients, but this study identified some pretty staggering savings figures. Tell us about the research and what you did find. Yeah, so this research specifically focused on one of the rule categories that we have, even a component of one of the rule categories we have in the High Touch RX suite of rules and rule categories. So we looked specifically at how we can leverage managed care pharmacists who are part of the High Touch RX team to drive generic drug utilization in the multiple sclerosis space where there are generic alternatives available and where we have that clinical appropriateness and ability to reduce not only the gross cost and net cost to our clients, um, but also contain member cost as well. So looking at kind of all of those pieces in addition to the trade considerations, um, just trying to enforce some of the upstream strategies that are in place and things that slip through the cracks uh, that maybe require more of that high-touch approach. So this study clearly shows the value of adopting these uh, MCP-facing tools. And obviously, it's imp- about improving the outreach between pharmacist to provider and pharmacist to pharmacist. But what are some of the challenges that we see in adopting these tools? Yeah, that's a great question. So the MCP, managed care pharmacists, 
um, conduct these outreaches on behalf of clients. We also have clients conducting these outreaches using Blues Plans pharmacists. I think as far as the adoption goes, there are questions about are we going to be able to replicate the success that we've seen historically. And we try to really support that through user forum meetings where you bring together people who have been using this platform for years now and new users of the platform to try to provide that insight on strategic approaches that can kind of help to address that concern. I would say that's probably the largest concern we have as far as implementation is we've had a lot of historical success. Will we be able to replicate the same thing with our lives? Mm -hmm. um, and to date, I think we've had tons of success in, in our ability to have success in a, in a broad range of populations. So what are some of the other complex disease states where we have seen that a transition to generics might lead to a marked improvement in therapy and health outcomes? When we think about generic transition, I think of it as a relatively low risk type of intervention. We have sort of the FDA rubber stamp at that point to say, these are equivalent products. We would expect the same sort of health outcomes regardless of if you're using a brand or generic product. This has been a really big one for us in the multiple sclerosis space. There's been a lot of um, amenability to that recommendation. I think moreover, cancer drugs, which can be exceptionally expensive and can offer generic alternatives, there's a willingness on the part of the provider to do things that can generate savings for members. Um, but really, we target so broadly in the brand to generic space with obviously the nuanced perspective of can we drive these on the basis of the formulary benefit design for the member, existing trade agreements, and everything else. So <clears throat> it's a really broad range of things that we target in this space. I would say that cancer is one of the kind of additional areas where brand to generic mm -hmm. can really drive substantial savings with a minimal impact on real health outcomes, at least from the perspective that we have on how those generic alternatives compare to the brand products that they're using now. Okay. Well, so now we're asking some guests some additional questions, yeah. and it's trivia based on our host city of New Orleans. And so here is your trivia question right. to test your knowledge. So Café du Monde is a famed establishment known for their coffee and beignets, but the coffee they serve is unique as it's mixed with something different. What is it? Oh. I'm going to go ahead and guess mm. cocoa. I have no Ooh, idea. That's a good guess. It's chicory. Oh, yeah, I've heard of chicory coffee before. That's yes. a good, that is a good trivia question. Now, I'll, I'll give you the bonus question. Do you know what chicory is? It's some type of nut or seed, isn't it? It's the root of an endive plant. Oh, wow. Isn't that yeah, wild? Yeah, you're blowing my mind here, for <laughs> sure. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that we could uh, teach you a little something about uh, chicory coffee. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. One of the goals of AMCP is to achieve improved access to care. And our next study looks closely at the factors that may impact that access. Social determinants of health are the conditions in a person's environment that affect health, function, and quality of life outcomes and risks. These factors contribute to as much as 80% of variation in health outcomes. In this segment, Kyle Thompson, data scientist principal with Prime MRX, talks about how the development of a Medicare member-specific medication non-adherence risk score related to social determinants of health can improve how an individual manages medication and adheres to a primary care treatment. Hit it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, not a bad setup, isn't it? No. Yeah, that sounds nice. I know. <laughs> <laughs> ben was Ben was getting a lot of uh, joy out of doing the really close-up microphone. Time. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kyle, it's good to have you on the podcast. How's AMCP going? Thanks, Alex. Uh, it's going great. Learning a lot. Uh, just trying to take it all in. That's great. So social determinants of health is a huge topic with a ton of variables. How did you design this research to get such a focused conclusion? Uh, it takes a few years of work to get to this point. Uh, colleagues have been doing a lot over the past few years. Uh, roughly two years ago, I reached out to a few people and informally started a health equity connection group across Prime and now Magellan Combined Company. And uh, so it's taken a lot to get to this point and a lot of research. 
But then we asked, okay, now we have a focused product, a focused ask, ask for this Medicare population. And we said, what's available? What can we do quickly? And how can we explain it transparently to clients without going into too many details and trying to take on the, the whole world of social determinants of health? So what are some of the best sources of data for addressing health equity and social determinants of health? Yeah, so I was on the PQA Health Equity Technical Expert Panel, and it included a number of people that had expertise in this area, and a lot of organizations have this expertise. Um, what they kind of did is rank variables, and the top two that show up are always age and sex. But then for Medicare, you got your three variables that are low income subsidy, dual eligibility with Medicaid, and then uh, disability, largely determined by the Medicare enrollment. So if someone ages into Medicare or enrolls in Medicare for disability reasons. So how do we and other healthcare organizations use this data and what are some of the incentives to improving health equity? Yeah, previously, uh, prior to 2024, there were very few monetary incentives to improving health equity with the Medicare health equity framework for 2022 to 2032 and the health equity index. Uh, starting this year with data collection in 2024, there are now monetary incentives to make this happen. Um, and so the health equity index is those three Medicare variables only to start with. But there are a lot of organizations using other variables. And for the future, we incorporated some of those variables, seeing as this product could evolve and this research could evolve down the line. So as we noted previously, um, Improved access to care is a core principle of Prime MRX. So what are some of the reactions you've heard from people at the show in response to the research? Uh, well, I know that there's a talk this afternoon, so uh, hopefully people can listen to that with uh, Ben Urich, Lisa Luer, and Su Sujit Ramachandran. Uh, so I, I hope to get some feedback there. Um, I haven't heard a lot about social determinants of health specifically to our research, but the talks typically are crowded on the related lectures, and um, everyone kind of has their own spin and uses their own data. Some are focused on the platforms, some are focused on the clinical outreach. Uh, we think we developed something that's very simple for pharmacies to use to incentivize outreach for adherence to members and not think too much about it after that, because we've done the, the hard work. That's great. So. We're asking trivia questions. Okay. So this is this is something this is going to be a surprise for you, but it's about New Orleans. It's about our host city, and just wanted to see if we can test your knowledge. So here's your question: This jazz legend, born in New Orleans, is nicknamed Satchmo. What is his real name? Uh, I don't know for sure. I'm going to guess because I think the airport is named Louis Armstrong Airport that that might be. You got reasonable. it. Yeah. Nicely done. Okay. Nicely done and nice tie into the uh, airport name. That's good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. We really, really enjoyed the conversation, Kyle. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Alex. As we've noted, AMCP's mission is to enhance the quality and affordability of healthcare. Prime MRX is also focused on this mission, which is even more crucial when you consider a key category driving healthcare spend today is high cost medications called specialty drugs, which are used to treat several severe diseases and conditions. We caught up with Kristen Reimers, Senior Vice President of Specialty Clinical Solutions at Prime MRX, to talk about some of the presentations at AMCP that touch on this important business segment. Well, so Kristen, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. And obviously, AMCP is a big deal. How's it been for you so far? Oh my gosh, there's so much excitement in the air. You could, it's palpable, really. And the spring meeting is always a great start to the year. Everyone's excited. And there's not only an amazing educational agenda and sessions that you can go to, but there's really great panels where you have industry leaders talking about you know the things that they're experiencing and their issues and concerns. And you have an opportunity to speak with them and network with them, even 
talk to the people next to you as you're sitting through the sessions. So um, it's always a great time to, to meet new friends, get new uh, contacts within the overall industry, and then catch up with longtime colleagues and see what they're up to and, and you know, the changes in their careers. And then, you know, there's really a palpable buzz in the air when you go down to the exhibit hall and see all of the amazing posters that are down there and the exhibitors and the things that are happening within our industry. So it's been a great experience so far here it's in New Orleans. It's a great show. A lot of good energy. So tell us a little bit about how Specialty Clinical Solutions is connected to the AMCP presentation sessions this year. Yeah, we have three really unique presentations that uh, we submitted to AMCP and the educational panel uh, selected them. Obviously, these were in line with some of the objectives of this year's meeting. And the first one is on um, drug wastage and eliminating drug wastage. It's in collaboration with one of our health plan partners, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. And um, it really talks about unique strategies that can be put in place and really make a difference in eliminating drug wastage and um, improving overall health care affordability for members. The second is really a thought-provoking uh, session on management strategies for cell and gene therapies. These are some of the most costly therapies in the market today, oftentimes over a million dollars on an annual basis for these types of therapies for very rare disease states where there have not been overall management strategies available. So this ensures that the right patients are having access to these therapies when they need to. We talk about management strategies for some of these, as well as figuring out how are we going to pay for these therapies as an overall healthcare industry and make sure that we're able to get these right therapies to treat these very rare disease states to members when they need them. And then the third session is we are participating in a panel on interchangeable biosimilars and the difference in the impact that these biosimilars have made. And we've seen tremendous impacts of the biosimilars in the oncology space for infused oncology therapies. And then uh, adding the fact that there's interchangeable biosimilars for things like insulin and the autoimmune drugs like Humira, they're really making a big difference. So uh, talking about patient advocacy as well as the availability of these products and then um, providing other options for members that are more cost effective for them. So how are these topics decided and what are some of the impacts? Yeah, these are really meaningful examples. All three of those sessions are meaningful examples of how member access and affordability can really be impacted by certain strategies, putting, putting those strategies in place and considering the overall clinical outcomes for the members, as well as the most cost-effective therapies and, and overall lowering costs for members. So what are some of the up-and-coming topics that are important to the future of specialty management? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are really looking at specialty drugs across the pharmacy benefit, those that are self-administered, as well as the medical benefit, those are that are health plan administered. And being able to look that at those in a holistic approach from a member perspective, overall therapies, and ensuring that the their those members are getting the best quality health care that they absolutely can. We're looking at data and incorporating historical data with forecasting tools and the new drugs that are coming out on the pipeline. There's practically a new drug that gets approved almost every month that is a specialty drug. These are extremely high cost drugs. So using these forecasting tools to mold strategies to create unique for health plans is extremely helpful to have those impacts like our drug wastage program that really help make a difference for affordability for drugs. And then um, another really hot topic is regulatory um, right now. So the regulators and the lawmakers are really focused in on things that are happening in healthcare and overall uh, health care affordability for drugs for members. And I think working with organizations like AMCP and others and helping to educate those lawmakers in terms of the downstream effects to both providers and members makes such a big difference. So that's a really huge topic, understanding the, the regulations that are being contemplated that are out there and affecting our overall industry. And then central to everything is really member care. That is at the heart at every absolutely everything that we do and so vitally important. So breaking down the social determinants of health and the barriers to access and 
paramount to absolutely everything is really uh, improving affordability for our members. So I have one last question for you. Sure. This is not prepared, but it's in the spirit of the show and of course our host city, New Orleans. So we're asking guests questions to see what they know about the Big Easy. And so here is your question. The Sazerac was named the official cocktail of New Orleans in 2008. It's a close relative of the old fashioned and it contains rye whiskey or brandy, bitters, sugar, and this unique spirit. What is it? I have no idea. I'm going to guess Aperol. You are very close. Absinthe. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's something to try while you're yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for the tip. Thank you for joining us today, Kristen. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Nothing might matter more than getting new talented and bright pharmacists in our door to get hands-on experience of specialty and medical drug management from a managed care perspective. Yu Chen Liu, Senior Director of Clinical Account Services, talks about how our ASHP accredited residency program allows people interested in the field to build their careers. She talks about the importance of developing a first-hand understanding of medical and pharmacy benefit integration and strategy and touches on the skills and mindset needed to kickstart careers as a managed care pharmacist. So Yu Chen, it's always great to see you. How has AMCP been so far? Fantastic, great crowds. We uh, are presenting, or my, my team specifically, we are uh, presenting three podium sessions mm -hmm. at this conference. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them were very well received. So overall, I think fantastic experience for all of us here. That's great. So obviously you're here today to talk about the residency program, but yes. let's perhaps hear a little bit about your experience in the residency. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I graduated pharmacy school in 2014. Um, I did my postgraduate residency program in managed care with Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. It was a one year residency program. And that's really what opened up my eye to the managed care space. I mean, managed care is not really a subject that's taught very well in pharmacy school. So a lot of students are not aware that, you know, managed care space even hire pharmacists. Mm -hmm. So the residency experience is truly what opened up the door for me to go into managed care pharmacy. And hence my passion for giving back to the community, giving back to the students to be able to mentor and shadow them up through their career for me to take on this role as residency director. So I'm very excited about that. That's really great. So this is the first year that Prime and MRX residence programs have been combined. Correct. Tell us a little bit about what's new with that approach. Yeah, so before we were two separate organizations, we each had our own residency program. And now that we're one organization, it makes sense for us to combine that. Um, the new curriculum is actually going to be a, a specialty and medical pharmacy focused curriculum understanding that specialty pharmacy, that's going to be the future of our practice. And there's a huge emphasis now on medical pharmacy management. So again, the purpose, if you come back to the root of why a student should do a residency program, is ultimately to be able to be well positioned on the job market. Mm -hmm. And we want our residents to be well positioned on the job market by giving them a very unique experience very focused in specialty and medical management space, which is our strength and something that not a lot of programs out there are going to be able to offer. So you're, you're a resident, you're looking for a program. Mm -hmm. What does Prime MRX offer that sets it apart from another organization? Sure, so we are one of the accredited programs in the residency space. So we are ASHP accredited residency program. Not all, all managed care programs are accredited. And of course, being accredited comes with good perks that you can become board certified after you complete the residency program. Uh, as a student looking for a residency program, I really think that the long-term trajectory of where you're going to land a position or how well you can be positioned on the job market is very important. Prime Magellan is a growing organization. There are plenty of opportunities. We are looking at the residency program as potentially a pipeline for our own candidates. 
you know, coming onto the organization. We want them to be very well positioned, and that definitely needs to be something that's taken into consideration when the students look for a position in this current job market. So how has the resident experience changed in the last few years, and what trends are shaping the future of these programs? Sure. So uh, traditionally, I, I can speak uh, to the Magellan program specifically, that the program was very heavily focused in PBM operations, um, utilization management, as well as Medicare Starheatus programs, because historically that's where managed care focus was. It's bring up the Starheatus metrics for these Medicare patients when MTM first uh, was implemented in the managed care space, that's where a lot of manual effort went in. And that's where a lot of pharmacists was hired for those positions. So historically, that's where the residency uh, program was really focused, is to train the residents to be in those areas. But now we see a gradual shift to specialty and medical pharmacy. That's going to be the future of the, 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 the managed care space, and that's going to be the future of the job market. So we want to make sure that we provide our residents with sufficient knowledge in that space, again, to be able to stand out among their peers when it comes time for the job search process after the residency program. That's why we made this whole effort to shift from the traditional and the Medicare side over to the specialty medical side, which is what's going to be the program for us combined organization next year. Okay, so we have one more question for you. And this is a departure from the topic because what we're doing is we are asking our guests New Orleans-based trivia. Oh. And so we have a question for you. The Mississippi River flows through the heart of the Crescent City and ends in Pilotstown, or Pilottown, Louisiana, about 85 miles from here. Where does the Mississippi River start? Oh my gosh. I will say geography is not my best <laughs> subject. Let me take a wild guess. So the Mississippi River is the longest river in the U.S., I believe. Mm -hmm. So it must be crossing multiple different states. So up north, I'm gonna take a wild guess and say Pennsylvania. Minnesota. Okay, I was nowhere close. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right. Yu Chen, thank you so much for stopping by and thank you very much for your work to support the next generation of professionals. Thank you, my pleasure to be speaking with you all. Thank you to all of our experts for sharing how Prime MRX uses integrated medical and pharmacy claims data to evaluate real-world drug utilization, managed care pharmacy programs, and associated costs of care for a range of conditions. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes where we'll discuss how NPS and provider relations can help deliver a positive member experience across all preferred channels, one that helps deliver better health outcomes, lower costs, and deeper transparency. Thanks for listening. I'm Alex Cook.